Godot 4 is on the horizon, it's the 24th of January and we've just entered alpha. Now it's too soon to start porting your projects right now, you're going to have to wait till it gets into beta when they have the feature freeze for that, but you can get a head start right now and start trying everything out in all its glory. You can try the Vulkan renderer, the GD script rewrite, you can get global tweens, global illumination, the new shader compiler, you can get a modern editor theme and... Oh god, okay, but okay, so this, the changelog is struggling to keep up, but we can cover a few essential changes to GDScript now so that you can get straight into the editor and hit the ground running. So here we are in Godot 4. Look how swish it is, we've got some lovely volumetric fog in the background, the generic environment's nicer, the actual interface has had a big overhaul, it's, it's really quite pleasant to be in. I've created a little scene for us to mess around in already that's just a control with a button in the centre. No real changes to Godot 3 there, but most of the significant changes are going to occur in the overhaul of GD script. So I'm going to dive into here and I'm going to run a few of the stumbling blocks you'll come across when you try to just translate the stuff you already know about. So first of all, a few of the keywords now have at signs at the start, things like on ready, export, tool, they all have at at the beginning, and the reason they do that is because of a bit of a change to the syntax. They now support having parentheses afterwards to provide parameters. That's useful in particular for exporting specific values. But what it means for you in practice is when you try to declare a variable on ready, you need to say at on ready instead of just on ready. So I can create the button here, and I can set it equal to that path. There we go, and it's even got some nice new syntax highlighting in orange as well for that specific kind of tag. Showing you those export options as well, I can also export a string as before, but with an at before export. So var button name, let's call it, and let's declare it as type string. And if I save that and go over to the inspector, you'll see we can access the name of the variable and it gets a text field for you to update it. Now that colon and setting the class name is from Godot 3, that is present in the last version of Godot, but there's a lot more reason to use it in Godot 4 versus Godot 3. The main reason you'd want to do this kind of type definition as much as possible now is because there is a performance improvement from knowing the types of variables we're dealing with. In fact, in some cases it can go up to about 150%, so it is very important to know about that and use it whenever possible. There's plenty of resources online you can find about learning how to use uh, the built-in typing to best effect. It's also quite readable most of the time, so very worth learning if you're going forward with Godot 4. Some of those other options I was talking about that involve parentheses are stuff like exporting ranges. If I export range, you can see it opens parentheses, and now we can pass two parameters to that export. Let's have our range go from 1.0 to 10.0 and then call it my range. Now if I save and I go over to the inspector, we get a line and we can pick any point between those two values. This was possible in Godot 3, but the important changes it involved having extra constant types involved. It was just uglier, and I think this is a really nice improvement overall. So that's adding at before a bunch of specific keywords. The next main thing you're going to come across when you try to do things you did previously are coming across callables and using those. So whenever you connected functions previously, you would usually refer to the function names with their string name. You would wrap it in quotes when you were referring to them. That's no longer the case, and it's a huge improvement, and it makes, the it makes the language feel a lot more modern, which is very nice. So I'm just going to show you it in action so that you can see just how slick this is compared to what it used to be. So say I want to connect the buttons pressed signal to a function I've defined. Well, I'll define a function now, my function, and that function is just going to quit the game. Now if I want to connect that button's pressed signal, I can go into the button and you can access all of its signals and all of its functions as properties just with dot and just the name of it, no strings involved. So I can just do dot pressed and now we are referring to the object that is the pressed signal within that button. 
Now, because it's an object, that means we can access properties of the signal. And the signals now contain a connect function. So now we can do object.signal.connect. And we can pass it a function we want that signal to call whenever it's emitted. So we can pass in our function just by its name, no strings involved again, my function. And now whenever the press signal is emitted, our function gets called. It's that clean. No passing around string names. It's just really nice. Let's see it in action. And it quits. It's really slick. And these callables, it lets you do things like lambda functions. We can now punt pass functions around anonymously, it affords some really powerful programming control that you just didn't have in previous iterations of Godot. It's really lovely and it's going to be a huge improvement and there's definitely going to need to be lots of tutorial content around because I know in my university course Lambda functions were a real struggle for everyone, but obviously very powerful. So these callables then lead into the next main thing we need to cover, which is a keyword that has been completely replaced. Yield doesn't exist anymore. You can't find it. It shouldn't have been called yield. Yield is a word in Python that is specifically for returning a generator, which is very unique to Python's framework, but it's quite distinct from waiting till a certain time. And yield in Godot was used to wait until a signal occurs. Now, its name reflects what it's trying to do. It's called a wait because it waits till the signal happens and it stops flow of control within the function until that thing occurs. So in our ready function, we can await an event and then the code after it won't run until that event's occurred. By event, I mean a signal being emitted. So for example, let's await on our button pressed signal coming out. Let's do await. We don't need parentheses anymore, it's just a keyword and then the callable that you are awaiting. So we're going to await button.pressed. There we go. And now our ready function will just wait until the button emits a pressed signal. And we can call my function now. Notice it's not connected anymore, it's just when it's ready, it's going to wait for the button press and then it's going to run our function when the button press happens. Same functionality as before, but we're using await instead of connecting. And you can use awaits like this to chain things in lots of interesting ways. The key use case you are likely familiar with for using, re uh, for using yields is yielding a timer's timeout signal. Now that's a really elegant process, because now we can you get tree.createTimer as we could in Godot 3. Uh, and we can tell it how long we want to wait for. Uh, let's do three seconds. And now we can access the timeout function on the end of it, the timeout signal even. Now it's just going to uh, create a timer, set it for three seconds. After three seconds, it emits a timeout signal. When this function sees that timeout signal is emitted, control will continue and we will run our function. So if I run this after three seconds, we should quit. One, two, three. Yeah, I can't count well, but yes. So there we are, that's the await function. It's really, really lovely. The last thing to touch on is tweens. So say I want to add a tween to this project. La da 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 da, I'm going to add a tween. Where's the tween? It's not there. Well, the reason it's not there is tweens have been removed in Godot 4. Now you might be wondering, how on earth can you just remove tweens? They're integral for animations where you don't know a start and an end state. Well, you never really needed tweens to be in your scene. All they ever did was you'd tell them an object, a property to manipulate, what its start value is, what its end value is, and how long you want it to animate for. The tween never needed to be in your scene to do that. So what they've done is they've made tweens work the same way this timer does. What you do is you create a tween from the scene tree, and then you just use that for doing your animations. And it means you can create them anywhere, and you don't need to add them to your own scenes, because it's always only one line anyway. And it's quite efficient. They've also added a significant number of improvements to the way the tweens actually run. They have a few very useful new properties. So let's just try it out. Let's reconnect our button pressed. And now let's make it so when we press our button, our tween will run. So we can create a tween here.
And now we can use the old interpolate property functions and all the rest of the stuff that you're used to as tweens, or we can use the new nice things. There are a bunch of typical use cases that come up again and again that they've made quick functions for you to do. One of the typical things you want to do is you want it to tween a value from somewhere to somewhere, and then you want to tween it from somewhere to somewhere else afterwards, and yada yada. You want it to sequentially do things. Well, now we have the tween property function. Tween.tween property. And what you do is you pass in the object you want to tween, our button, the property you want to manipulate, modulate if we want to control color, let's do that. And then what you want it to tween to. You don't need to tell it the start value anymore, it figures it out. So it's it's just exactly what you need it for. So let's tween our buttons modulate to go red. And then you tell it how long you want it to last for. One second. So now, over one second, it will turn it from the color it is to red. And if we put another one of these afterwards, like this, and we choose a new color, like aqua, now it will turn it red over a second, then once that's done, over the next second it will turn it aqua. And I think we can add function calls at the end as well. So let's do tween dot tween callback. And now it's going to do a callable at the end. So let's call the buttons queue free function. There we go. So now it's going to turn red, it's going to turn aqua, and at the end it's going to call the queue free function on the bottom. Look how slick that is. Let's just run it. Let's watch it. Hell yeah. And that's how tweens work. So those are a bunch of essential things you should know about when you're starting with GD script, but you can really just dive into it. The documentation's fairly good. There are a few key scenes that have useful templates built in too. So if you want to try out something new like the new character to character body 2D uh, controller and you want to attach a script to it, it's got a lovely template attached, basic movement. You create that and it comes with movement built in. It, it gives you jumping off the bat, it gives you moving left and right with basic input events, uses move and slide, it shows you the intended way to use that function. So do keep an eye out for those templates when you can, they're very informative. And do enjoy Godot. We're in a whole new cutting edge world. So do dive in, have fun, and uh, cheers. <laughs>